Well, everyone, thank you so much for joining today and uh, inviting me to join you. I know I'm really limited on time, um, so I'm going to move through things pretty pretty quickly today. Um, Sarah has my contact information. It's also on this uh, presentation, so if you have any follow-up questions, anything you want further explanation of or whatnot, feel free to reach out to me anytime. So, um, I don't know if Sarah mentioned, my name is Kim Reitmeyer. I am the Executive Director of the ANCSA Regional Association. We represent the CEOs of the 12 Alaska Native Regional Corporations. So um, we'll talk a little bit about the organization and the intent on a few slides. Um, I grew up in Anchorage, Alaska. Um, I have a previous work history within the oil and gas industry, within tourism. Um, before joining the ANCSA CEOs um, and uh, life, lifelong here and, and my husband and I have two, uh, two young boys that we chase around 24-7. So um, <laughs> my family is originally from Kodiak. Uh, my father was a commercial fisherman. Um, he also was on the very first board of directors for Koniag when ANCSA was formed. My grandfather was instrumental in being part of the Kodiak area during land claims and during that settlement act. So um, it's, it's really an honor for me to work for the 12 regional corporations and, and carry that work forward. Next slide. Okay, so you all have probably heard how Alaska is different and, and that is one of the, the most common catchphrases I hear is Alaska is different. I onboarded two um, CE or two presidents for Alaska Pipeline Service Company and the common thread was when people tried to tell them how different Alaska was and how operating um, in Alaska was so different, they would often say, well, you know, I've worked all across the world. Alaska can't be that different. And both times, both CEOs came back to me within three months and said, oh my gosh, you were so right. Alaska is so vastly different in the cultural values, in the business operations. But we all hear how, you know, Alaska has the most coastline, I love to tell people when I travel that, you know, if you divide Texas in half, um, a Texas be or Alaska becomes the, the third largest state. So, or excuse me, if you divide Alaska in half, Texas becomes the third largest state. So we really are vast. And when I get the questions of, we want to do business with the native corporations, tell us about the native corporations. As you can see from this map, it's like taking someone from Grand Forks, Minnesota, compared to someone that grew up in Charleston, South Carolina. You can't expect those two individuals to have the same life experiences, the same cultural values, um, the same history. And so that really is true with the Alaska Native population. And in our size, it creates such a diversity even within the Alaska Native cultures that it's very difficult to say, this is the one avenue or this is the one thing you need to know about the Native corporations. Next slide. Oh, are you seeing the next slide? Trying, why am I not advancing? <laughs> <laughs> Uh oh. There we go. I don't okay. know what. Oh, good. I am so glad this happens to someone else because usually when I'm driving, it's not all the, the <laughs> technical things happen. I know. Sorry. So, um, as we know, um, Alaska Natives have been in Alaska for more than 10,000 years. Our 2010 census showed us that we had about 16% Alaska Natives. Uh, the 2020 census is getting ready to kick off here in January. Um, anticipating well over 20% uh, Alaska Native return on that is what we'll see. If you divide Alaska, you'll see kind of seven major cultural groups, the Nupiaks, the Yupiks, the Aleuts, the Eaks, the Clinket and Haida, the Simpsian, but then there's also a number of Northern Athabascan cultures that you see, and they're defined by their language groups. So oftentimes, this is a very common map that you'll see that defines the, the major territorials for the language groups and the cultures. Um, over two dozen languages, and then every village has a very different relationship and communication protocols, customs, and traditions, just like we talked about. Um, you know, if you put that uh, Alaska superimposed over the U.S. map, is it's very different protocols within our different communities. Go ahead, next slide. 
I'm going to go through these pretty quick. So just real quick, we have to go all the way back to the Treaty of Session um, in 1867 that talks about how the, quote, uncivilized tribes are subjected to laws and regulations in the United States. Um, this is where all the Aboriginal uh, uh, rights start to come into form and how we're treated by Congress. Go ahead, next slide. Alaska is really unique in the fact that it has, it's the only state with two organic acts. And this first organic act all the way back in 1887, that second bullet really talks about and pinpoints that the Indian people shall not be disturbed in their land. And basically, if they are, any future action is reserved for by legislation by Congress. So anything that happens after 84 for Aboriginal rights and the land claims has to be a congressional act that's already determined in that first organic act. Next slide. So then obviously the second organic act uh, creates the territory. We become a state. About this time in 1959, you really start to see the Alaska Native political groups start to rise up to talk about land claims. We start to, um, we start to hear um, our, our, our Alaska Natives in Southeast really are seen to kind of take that charge too and start to uprise in that political right. And so in 66, then Secretary of the Interior Udall put a land freeze. Lots of going on in the US in the 60s and he just said, you know what, we've got to get this right. We've, there's too many facets from every direction, put a land freeze on. And then odd thing happens in 68, we find oil in Alaska, the largest oil field in North America. So now we've got to figure out how to get that oil to market. And so there's really a, a number of things that you'll hear that ANCSA was signed only because oil was discovered. Um, you know, it really was a timing mechanism because in December 1971, Nixon signs into act the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act. So that solves Alaska Native claims, starts to uh, abolish Aboriginal rights and puts that into effect in December of 1971. Next slide. So, what does the act do? The act creates just under 44 million acres of land. That land is held in fee simple title and just under a billion dollars. And this is money paid for lands that couldn't be returned. We already had uh, townships, we had um, Anchorage, we had petroleum reserves, national park reserves. So this money, um, while some people might say it was startup money, this was actually in lieu of lands that couldn't be returned. It creates 13 regional corporations. They have, uh, the regional corporations have no federal overview like you would hear of a, a tribe in the lower 48. We also create 200 village corporations, about 211 village corporations, and they're created independently of the regional corporation. Uh, at this point in time, you um, individuals were uh, enacted to register with their regional corporation. So if you were one quarter blood quantum, um, depending on where you lived at the time or where your ancestry was proven, you registered within that regional corporation. So you were provided 100 shares of that regional corporation at the time. Go ahead, next slide. And this is what we created. You can see these are the regional corporations. Um, if you're looking at the map, there are 12 land-based regional corporations on that map, but there's also a 13th regional corporation that was created for our shareholders that were not residing in the state of Alaska at the time, couldn't trace their lineage back to a particular region, or didn't want to. So they registered for the re 13th regional corporation, which was based out of Seattle, Washington. So currently the 12 land-based regional corporations are all still um, very much alive and viable. The 13th regional corporation um, is in a state of flux right now where um, they have a non-operational board. Um, we have um, thankfully uh, maintained their shareholder records and looking for future legislation of what we uh, could do for these uh, members of this regional corporation. So um, I'm just, 
sorry, frantically looking for a few notes here. Um, so these regions were created by common heritage or common interest. What's interesting, if you remember that, that language map that we overlaid in the, in the beginning that I showed you, that very much matches some of these regions. What more matches this region is if you overlaid all the religious um, sects in the state, they would very much follow very closely to these borders of these regional corporations are divided by um, not only common interest and heritage, but also religion. So while we have these 12 Alaska Native regional corporations that are very vast in their business operations, their business portfolios, if you knuckled down all of their mission statements, you would really find three common threads and it's the profitability and the economic self-sufficiency of our shareholders. It's the preservation and the celebration of our heritage, and it's the ownership of the land. The land is essential. So um, I mentioned the, the 12 regional corporations. Today, those village corporations, the separation of regional versus village, there's about 165, 170 active village corporations, many merged or even merged with their regional corporations. So we today still have 12 regional corporations and about 165 village corporations. If you look at um, shareholders total for all 12 regional corporations, we're over about 130,000 at this point. Um, we have what we call um, closed corporations and open corporations by enrollment. And I'll talk a little bit about that in the next slide. Go ahead. So just real quick, regional corporations are standalone for-profit companies focusing really on that triple bottom line. It's that economic returns, the benefits to the shareholders, but it also ties in the community and the envir environment essential to their missions. Um, not all Native people today living in any given area are shareholders. ANCSA was signed December 17th, 1971, December 18th, 1971, excuse me. So that closed versus open enrollment that I just mentioned, I'll use myself as an example. I'm a member of CONIAG and CONIAG is closed enrollment. So when my children were born, they were not automatically shareholders. I have to gift them shares or they're obviously in my will to my shares will be willed to them. So because they're automatic because they're born, they're not automatic shareholders. Arctic Slope Regional Corporation is is an open company. So um, the, the woman that works for me is was born after 1971. She's a shareholder, but she does not hold her shares in perpetuity when she passes her shares go back to the corporation, not her children. So it's vastly different um, classes of shares to whether you're an original shareholder, if you were born after 1971, um, different, different types of shares that you have within each corporation. So about six of the regional corporations have open enrollment. Um, to give you an example, Chalista in 2017 voted to open their roles. So in 2017, they had about 13, just over 13,000 shareholders. At the end of 2019, after two years of open enrollment process, there'll be over 35,000 shareholders. So you can tell we have a, a, a next generation of ANCSA leadership that really is a focus of trying to get into these corporations and how we can grow our corporate corporations with our future shareholders. Um, as I mentioned, regional corporations own their land fee simple, but they also own the subsurface estate. A good way to delineate a village corporation versus a regional corporation is the regional corporation owns the subsurface estate and the village corporation owns the surface estate. Also village corporations and regional corporations, um, nonprofits and, and, and all this tangled web that you hear, they're not subsidiaries of the regional corporation. They're standalone for-profit entities. So when we talk about private land ownership in Alaska, next slide. We can look at um, between the state and the federal government, they own about 327 million acres of Alaska. That 44 million acres of that private land in Alaska means that our native corporations own 92% of all the private land in the state. So that significantly changed the viewpoint of private land ownership in Alaska and the economic feasibility of our, our regional corporations. Next slide. So 
we talked about the regional corporations and um, the the boundaries, and and it's that I'm a visual learner. So obviously, when you look at Doyon, Doyon's the largest land holder in North America. They own 12 and a half million acres of land. That's the size of country of France. But so when you looked at it on that slide a few while a few back, it's this big land mass. But actually, when you look at this map, the pink are native owned lands. Um, by surrounded by federal lands and state lands. So when you look at development of the lands, access of the lands, this just kind of tells a little bit different picture of um, how that land mass is divided and what it looks like. And, and how, you know, you hear trespass issues that you probably uh, hear about. And so it's really difficult when there's federal or state lands um, varying um, our, our native owned lands. Next slide. So I mentioned that stock um, can't be sold or traded. If I get mad at Cognac, like I would at Apple or any other stock that I hold, I can't sell my, my Cognac stock. So it really changes the perspective of these regional corporations. Many of them have 50 year strategic plans because we know the ownership of the corporations is not going to change. And there was amendment to ANCSA in 1991 that basically stated the um, stock alienation to preserve that right. Um, 7i and 7j, uh, these are really important and kind of um, mind boggling in our Western culture way of business. So when ANCSA was created, there's obviously a disparity of natural resource wealth. Uh, Arctic Slope Regional Corporation lays within a very rich um, oil and gas. Uh, sea Alaska was very rich in timber. Nana has our red dog mine. So there was a variation of resource wealth. So there's an, a portion of ANCSA that says, okay, you take 70% of your net profits from your natural resource development and you share that with the other 11 regional corporations. And then 7J takes it further and says, once you receive your 70%, you're going to take 50% of that and share it amongst your village corporations. So it's a sharing of our natural resource wealth that we obtain by our land because it is so essentially important. I mentioned earlier that I used to work for Alaska Pipeline and I used to just envision walking into the owners with Coke and Exxon and BP and say, okay guys, you get to share 70% of your profits with the others. And in a Western culture, in a business, that just makes a absolute no sense. It just is mind boggling for everyone. But it really creates that sustainability of our village corporations to be able to pay dividends, to operate their businesses. The trickle down within from a statewide perspective is just mind boggling. Um, I mentioned the land. Land is so important to our native corporations that if it's not developed, they don't carry that on their balance sheet. Any of us, if you have a financial advisor would tell you you're crazy if you own land someplace and you don't put that on your balance sheet. So it's just really keys into, again, the importance of the land and the culture and not carrying that on your balance sheets. Um, the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act has diversified Alaska's economy from the perspective of um, we're very fortunate to have great companies in our state like Lowe's or Target or whatnot, but they're headquartered outside the state doing business here, taking their profits, obviously back to their home base. All of the 12 regional corporations are doing business globally, returning those profits to Alaska and to our communities. If you take into account our scholarships, our donations and our philanthropic um, donations to, uh, to cultural activities and our dividends, those equivalent to more than 80% of net profits of the regional corporations. So when you take a look at any outside organization that's putting 80% back to their shareholders and back to their communities, I've yet to find an organization or an entity that does that but it really pinpoints how important those scholarships are, those dividends, and those donations to our nonprofits. Next slide. How are we doing on time? Uh, seven minutes. Seven minutes, okay. Yep. This, is, this is my board. Um, 
I heard the cats of the 12 uh, CEOs from the 12 land-based regional corporations. We were really brought together to keep the CEOs at the table talking, talking collaboratively. We work on policy, we work on ANCSA education, um, and it's just a really dynamic group. And it's really fun to see 12 business CEOs that are oftentimes competing in the same business sector really coming together and having those collaborative conversations. Next slide. When you look at revenues, we're, we're just updating 2018. I apologize, um, all our numbers. When you look at revenues for the regional corporations, in 1999, when we started collecting data, the total revenue was $2.1 billion. In 2017, it was over $9 billion. So really an, a steady, wonderful increase and shining star of the economic engine that these ANCs have become to play in our state. Um, it hasn't all been rosy and shiny for every, everyone. Um, more than one of the native corporations has filed for bankruptcy. Um, interestingly enough, it's been one of the other regional corporations that help, has helped them out of bankruptcy. Um, so just a, a, a really dynamic look of, of, their, uh, of their business portfolios. Next slide. In the state of Alaska, we have a, a, a marker called the Top 49 Award because we're the 49th state. We take, uh, they take a look at the top 49 privately owned businesses in the state of Alaska. Um, all 12 of the regional corporations have made that list consecutively. Um, and then, so that is the left-hand column that says Alaska Native Regional Corporations. This is a comparison of those 12 regional corporations the right hand bar that's a little bit lighter in color takes into account 11 village corporations that also made the top 49er data. So we take a look at what we call the Alaska Native corporations as a whole. So when you look at revenue from a private standpoint, 79% of the revenue in our state, and I just saw that spelling error, um, is, is derived from our Alaska Native corporations. When you look at Alaska jobs, we go to 71%, and then you look at global jobs, 88% of the global jobs are created from our uh, Alaska Native corporations. So again, really diversified in the business operations that they have. I've really not been able to find a business sector that they're not operating in. Go ahead, next slide. This is a great summary that talks about not only the dividends that are paid to our shareholders, this is a snapshot from just one year. When I talked about the um, 7i revenue sharing, $232 million was distributed within the regional corporations to then share again with their village corporations. Our donations, almost $16 million. Um, one of the things that is such the common thread through our regional corporations is scholarships, 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 and education. Every one of the regional corporations has an education foundation um, that's very engaged, invested in the future of their shareholders. So almost $8 million in scholarships in just one year alone. Um, obviously, we, we take a look at where we have employees and payroll. Um, the bubbles on the bottom depict our top 10 states operating of the number of employees and the payroll that we bring a um, billion dollars to Alaska. So really the native corporations, um, while, while vast in the people that we represent, also have a significant impact in the employment base in the state of Alaska with a billion dollars putting back into the revenue there. Next slide. But it really goes beyond the dividends and beyond some of those revenue numbers and things like that. There's so much, su such a greater reach that our native corporations have within our communities beyond the monetary benefits. It's the advocacy, but most importantly, it's those social and cultural, the education, the employment, the cultural camps that are afforded to some of our youth and, and individuals is just amazing. Elder benefits, um, many, most of the regional corporations have additional benefits monetarily that get paid out to our elders, um, burial benefits, uh, employment opportunities, leadership training. Um, it really just does go beyond what that initial um, uh, dividend does for, for our shareholders and our communities. Um, and I think next slide might be it.
sliding into home base. I hope I made the time. <laughs> I talk so fast, I don't know. Um, but if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer any questions now. Um, if you want to do it offline with phone calls, I'm happy to do that as well. Kim, this is Mike Cooperberg. Thank you so much. That was fabulous. I did not expect that presentation here, and that's super cool. I, I learned a lot. I learned a lot about the native corporations, and, and there's some opportunities buried in there that I think maybe um, we all are thinking about um, for the future. So really, really spectacular presentation. Thanks so much. Are there questions for Kim here in the room? I have a question. Hi, Kim. This is Meredith, and I um, live in Alaska, but I still don't really understand the relationship between the native corporations and the native nonprofits. Could you um, maybe elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, you bet. So, um, the nonprofits, and, and give me an example of maybe what you're one of the nonprofits that. Queric, for example. Sure. So um, within each, and I actually used to have this slide that showed a fishing net all tangled up with other fishing nets because it is such a tangled web of the whole ANC picture. And there's the regional corporations, there's the village corporations, there's the regional nonprofits, which would be Coeric. So, or there are the entities like AFN, myself, there's one called a ANVCA that represents the village corporations. It is such this, and then there's the tribes. So the tribes have the government to government relationship. Um, the nonprofits, again, are a complete standalone entity with its own board of directors, its own um, articles of incorporation. So they, off they operate complete independently of the regional corporation. So they're not a subsidiary of the regional corporation, but obviously they are designed to do support and um, socioeconomic services to the community. So it's, um, well, a good way might to think of it is the regional corporations are the for-profit business entity, and then the nonprofits are more on the socioeconomic side of the community. Does that help Thank at all? <laughs> Thank you. Kim, this is Sarah. Um, I'm, I'm curious it, if we, do your, do your, does your association bring together the uh, boards or at least the presidents of the um, regional um, corporations on an annual <clears throat> basis? If, if we wanted to have some exchange and some communication with them. What 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 mechanism do we use? You bet. We so we meet um, four times a year. Um, we also have an executive committee that meets an additional four times a year. Um, we have a, a policy committee um, and a communications committee. We have tried so while we um, our board of directors are the CEOs. We obviously know that within the organization are the essential people. Um, like the communications directors or the government relations group. We also work with the CFOs and the general counsels. So we try to take those core professional groups and work with them as well. So while um, you know an audience with the CEOs is, is an opportunity, there's also more opportunity within the organizations with their uh, senior leadership. So depending on you know kind of topics or what area it might be, um, you know obviously we, we tend to not to bring in individuals doing a financial ask um, to the CEOs, but, um, but certainly there's opportunities four times a year for conversations. We also do informational meetings. What, we, what we've coined and, and we invite broader audiences. Again, we focus in on what uh, specific groups within the organizations we might wanna target. Uh, I just met this morning with uh, Department of Energy, Indian Energy and, and talking about how we can target within the native corporations the appropriate audience audiences to get their message. That's very helpful, and we'll follow up with you on that. Um, it might be nice to be able to interact with the policy committee at some point. Um, so, uh, but uh, I'm so happy to get this um, 
communication channel open between your organization and IARPIC, which is trying to coordinate all this federally funded investment in the Arctic in a way that is um, mutually beneficial. Fantastic. And we we are just nearing the end of this month. We're doing a whole rebrand launch. We'll have a new website, new um, new logo, and we've we've kind of completely reinvented ourselves. So um, I'd, I'd ask that after September 30th, there'll be tremendous amount of information on our website too, because we really want to drive people to be that source um, for Anxan for that connectivity and for that education piece. Uh, Kim, this is Martin Jeffries at the Cold Regions Research and Engineering Laboratory in Hanover, New Hampshire. Thank you for your presentation. That was very informative. I lived in Alaska for many years, and I too learned a lot from your presentation. Um, I wanted to bring up one particular topic. Now, you, you described how the corporations give an enormous amount uh, back to the Alaska Native community and in a, a, a very social responsibility fashion, if I could call it that. Now, Alaska Natives, uh, individuals and organizations have expressed a, a strong interest in engaging more in the Arctic research enterprise, if you want to call it that. And, and there are many scientists in universities and elsewhere who are very interested in, in engaging in that fashion and working with Alaska Natives. From, a, from the Alaska Native perspective, one of the challenges is, for example, you know, traveling to conferences and workshops and planning meetings um, so that they can engage with scientists and, and create these partnerships and collaborations. I, I wondered if your organization has considered how it could contribute to helping out in this regard um, with travel funds to help Alaska Natives work with scientists to develop, for example, co-production of knowledge partnerships. That would be fantastic. And I know that, you know, I mentioned each regional corporation has an education foundation for scholarships, but, and, and a lot of those are going beyond traditional education as it may. So I, there's, there's other opportunities available within our education foundations that I think we could potentially explore. Um, we as an organization operate, you know, pretty, pretty minimal. Um, from that standpoint, but I think there might be, there might be opportunity. AFN, the Alaska Federation of Natives, has been hosting a um, round table with um, senior military officials and, and government uh, officials about the northernmost borders and securities and, and Arctic. And, and we even met this morning, as I mentioned, with um, Department of Energy about reinstituting the, the Arctic office on energy. And this might be a conversation that I think bringing in Julie Kitka from AFN would really tie in to one of their strategic pillars going forward. And okay. I'm happy, um, email me and I'm happy to make connections with, with Julie and Nicole at AFN to help find out what they've done thus far and how we could take that conversation going forward. Thanks, Kim. That, that sounds great. Yeah, wonderful. Thanks. So, Kim, this is Mike Cooperberg. We are over our allotted time, and we try to be um, yes, try not I to understand. do <laughs> our folks. So, thank you so much. This was fascinating. I suspect you have not heard the last from us, and you may have wished you never <laughs> gave us your email address. No, uh, no. This but, is wonderful. This is what we do, and and I would like to extend. Um, please, if you have other groups, if you'd like a longer sit down. Um, we would love the opportunity to, to talk further. Okay. Yeah, well, I, I think, you know, the next time that IARPIC is in, in Alaska, we want to make a point of catching up with you and, and, and having some face-to-face -face time. So, I would love that. Thank you very much. Fabulous. Okay. Thanks, all. Have a so, great afternoon. Thanks, thanks Kim. Thank you, Kim. So everyone, thank you so much for your patience and hanging with us. I know we're a little bit over time. Um, I will remind you of our uh, next meeting, October 7th, right? I'm trying to pull up the agenda. Oh, 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 yeah. No, it's October 7th. I was looking at 11 to 1. That's Alaska time, 3 to 5 p.m. 
uh, regular time on October 7th. Um, anything for the good of the In order? Alaska. That's the Alaska. That, yeah. Right. Led out of Alaska. So we look forward to that that uh, quarterly uh, change of pace. And um, anything else before we go? Thanks for hanging in there, everybody, um, for that presentation at the end. It was worth it. That was good stuff. Yeah. Okay, sir. Thank you, as always. All right. Thanks, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Yeah, that was fascinating. Sure.